Hello, welcome to the Curator Podcast. This is episode 21. Welcome once again, dear listener, to the Curator Podcast. I'm your host. I'm always your host. I'm Mark Fraser, and this is episode number 21. Two, one. You know, I figured it out the other day that it's going to be like, when I get to episode 26, that'll be six months, which is kind of scary, but, you know, time, man, time passes, it happens, shit happens, you deal with it. So, listener, my friend, I'm glad you could lend me your ears. You see, I'm a little bit stressed out. Since this podcast began, I have been trying very, very hard to get some women on the podcast. Now, I don't know why I've been unsuccessful in doing this. I have approached quite a few singers of bands and and authors and stuff, and I don't know, perhaps they're just really busy. Perhaps they're busier. Than most people, I don't know, or maybe I'm just aiming for the wrong people. That's also completely possible. But it's 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 causing me a bit of frustration. So far, all these twenty one episodes, it's been white hetero cis males, which is fine because that's not an issue. But having only men on the podcast, it's not wholly representative of my taste, my cultural taste, or of the cultural landscape. So I'm trying really hard to rectify that, so please, please bear with me. If you've got any suggestions of people that I could talk to, be that in Glasgow, in Scotland, or anyone that's just passing through nearby to me, please let me know. It's possible that maybe my taste is too narrow. It's possible that I'm perhaps just talking to the wrong people. I don't think it's got anything to do with with the people that I'm approaching. I think it's probably more availability, which is cool, you know. In this game having to go through publicists and PR people. These people get hundreds of requests every day from journalists like me trying to talk to the artists they represent. They can talk to everyone. Totally get that. That's probably what's happening here. But if I've missed something or if there's something else I could maybe try that I haven't thought of, please let me know. If there's anybody you would like me to speak to, then also please let me know. I'd really, really appreciate that. Anyway, enough of that. I just wanted to get that off my chest. It, it's not, I'm not totally misogynistic or anything like that. Maybe you haven't even noticed. Maybe maybe now that I've told, maybe, maybe now that I've said this, it's brought it to your attention. It's also totally possible. But I just wanted to, I guess it, one of the things about podcasting for me is that it's not about me. It's about the person I talk to. And I don't really like talking about myself that much. Maybe by saying what I just said there. It's reflective of me and my own personality. Maybe I've just revealed something about myself. I don't know. Anyway, fuck it. That's a thing. I'll fix that thing. Let's move on. On this episode, I have Casey from The Deer Hunter. Now, The Deer Hunter are a fabulously interesting band, I think. Casey is, is a genius. And as you'll find out in this really quite lengthy podcast, you can see... He can kind of get to know his working process a little bit, his creativity, where that all comes from. And he's just such a humble guy, such a nice, nice guy. I'm so I'm so glad I got the chance to talk to him. And yeah, it's, it was a good, really good chat. We talk about the new Deer Hunter album, Act 4, Rebuff and Reprise, which is pretty cool. And we talk a little bit about the whole his whole career, basically, you know. And it's, it's deep, man. We go down the rabbit hole and it's awesome and I hope you enjoy it. Now, now I've got a slight confession to make about this interview. I've recorded this interview way back, way back in August. And since then, I've put out a whole bunch of other interviews, which is, you know, which you've heard by this point, hopefully. Um, that's cool. But Casey wanted me to email him so that he could pick some tracks from their new album to put on this podcast. But 
I know he's on tour and he's been really busy, so I've decided to just to pick them myself. So I'm sorry, man, but this is just the way it is, I guess. Just a little bit of background on the Deer Hunter, really. If you know the Deer Hunter, then you know that in true prog rock fashion, they are a concept band for the most part. So far, they've had six albums, and as of this year, four of those albums follow an overarching story. And the story revolves around the birth, life, and abrupt death of a boy known as the Deer Hunter. And each of these parts of this story are told in different acts. So far, we're up, up to Act 4, and the scope of that project will be six albums, so there'll be another two acts to go, hopefully after this one but outside of that Casey's also done a couple of albums which are not part of that concept there's one called The Colour Spectrum which was essentially nine EPs really into every colour and the two shades which is just a monumental achievement that's 36 songs that's staggering and also a kind of more personal album a more kind of introspective album I guess called Migrant all of this adds up to a vast body of work we're talking lots of songs, lots of albums. We're talking all albums here, which are an hour plus. This is properly prog rock thing. But the thing is, people say prog rock. And people say they're a prog rock band, but they're they don't sound like Yes. They don't sound like Genesis. They sound like just a rock band, and that's why I fucking love them. Not that there's anything wrong with Genesis and Yes, but I just fucking I just really love the Deer Hunter sound. Anyway. I'm going to open this up with a song from their new album, Act 4, Rebirth and Reprise, and this song is called The Old Haunt.
Casey, how you doing? I'm good, how are you? I'm okay. I always get really nervous before interviews and then I just sweat like fuck. And I just sweat in general. I, that's so uh, We're on the same page. I'm glad now. I feel so much better now. <laughs> yeah, so as I was saying before, like I was sitting in the bar listening to people talking about um, trying to de- explain what the deer hunter is to, and the, one of the guys said, oh, they're a prog band. And his immediate reaction was like, Genesis or, or yes? And he was like, who are those bands? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's weird because prog is such a, it's it's like a term, kind of like how concept album is a term that a lot of people who, well, a lot of people that just listen to, to pop music have no idea. You say prog and they don't know that applies to a genre of music. But then a lot of people who are into music can hear the word prog. It's like sort of a an entry level turn off like concept record or something that they feel like would command too much of their time to get into. So it's like this, it has sort of a, to some people it has an amazing connotation and then to other people it has a very, not necessarily negative, but it's sort of, they have an indifference to it because they feel it's this or that. So it's always funny, but then when you look at the wide range of what a prog band can be, that it can be anything from a band like the Mars Volta to Dream Theater to Yes to, uh, what is it, King's X to Rush. All of these bands can be considered prog. If you flip through their discography, they have plenty of pop songs. But it's just bands who are less concerned with being tethered to a a focused, singular-minded genre and more just like, hey, I really love playing music. I'm just going to do this thing that I like. Whatever it is, let it be that. I think that's why sometimes people, when they're asked, like, what does the Deer Hunter sound like? It's like, well, do I explain them based on these folky songs or on these Latin bombastic songs or on these Dixieland songs or how do I convey them? And then you're stuck just saying, well, it's rock music, I guess, or it's prog or whatever. So it's funny. I do like hearing people ex- tell me what genre the band is, though. That's always fun. So, I mean, I wasn't going to ask you this question, but since it's come up, is prog something you think think the band is or have always thought the band is? Or is it just kind of like, I guess this is a thing, so... I'll go with it, or I think that Prague is kind of like the umbrella term when people run out of options. That's where like that's right, yeah. you know, because at the beginning of the band, I came from a, another band that was considered, I guess, somewhere between being post-hardcore and being at times called screamo and stuff like that. Again, in that band, they were things that we didn't care for, but it was just the what people heard in it and what they wanted to assign to it. So when the Deer Hunters started out coming out of that scene of bands that was the f- instinctual reaction was like oh it's a it's going to be another post hardcore band and then at first that was the kind of tour offers that the deer hunter would get and just because of the loose association and then as time went on it was like well it's an indie band and then as time goes on and there's more to it on a technical level well it's a prog band you know and uh i think because of that i uh, because of that sort of I've never declared it being one thing or the other. It's always been other people saying what it is. So for me, I don't really concern myself too much with that because I feel like the second that you commit yourself fully to one direction, not to name a terrible band, but as soon as you commit yourself to a single-minded approach to what you're doing, you kind of cut off the peripheral, and that is always, I think, a... uh, in a, as far as creative scope goes, it's it's not the best thing to do when when all you're really trying to do is be creative because that's all it is. I've never like it's interesting that I, I I didn't mean to bring it up, but I've never asked an artist about like the kind of music what they think the kind of music they play is. So it's interesting to hear an artist actually say like, well, well, I think that probably you know I think a good deal of bands do know what they're playing. I think a good deal of bands are like, well, you know, I'm I'm in I'm in just sort of like a a rock band but we have tendencies of punk or pop punk or I'm in a pop punk band or I'm in a you know ambient post hardcore band I think a lot of a lot of musicians in bands play music that is indicative of the music that they grew up on very in a very linear way whereas the music that I grew up on really doesn't sound much like my band it was a lot of um extremely varied stuff so the way that it kind of meets up in this band, I, I can't necessarily say I am following in the exact footsteps of all of my idols because, you know, whereas a lot of bands that would be 
playing like sort of the modern day like hardcore or punk music, they would they would be very it'd be very easy for them to say these are the exact influences that we have. These are the footsteps that we're following. This is the torch that we're carrying. The torch that I feel like I'm carrying is much more subconscious and loosely based. So I don't even know what kind of music that we really play. And that's not like a lot of people dodge that question. But if I had the answer, it would be the I would be the first to admit it. Like, yeah, we're, we are exactly this. Um, but that's also, I think, one of the reasons that one of the reasons we're not a very huge band is because some of what we do appeals to some people, some appeals to others, some people, the whole thing appeals to them. But because we aren't so spearheaded in a specific genre, we don't get fans just of a genre. We get Deer Hunter fans. We don't have like pop punk fans or hardcore fans or pop fans or anything like that. So I think a long time ago when I made the dis- conscious decision not to just be a specific type of band is when I stopped thinking about what kind of band we were. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so I should tell you the podcast about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, basically, this podcast about creativity and passion. Mm-hmm. So basically, you've done an enormous amount of work since your first record in 2006. Um, and... So I guess taking the theme of the podcast on board, Mm -hmm. it's probably a good idea to... Well, I was going to ask you this question to start with, but we've kind of diverged a little bit, so I'll ask it now. Um, When was the first time you remember you wanted to be a creative person? I think growing up the way that I grew up and in the family I grew up in, uh, creativity and specifically um, musical creativity was like another language... It was like growing up in a bilingual home where one thing was, you know, just speaking English and the other thing was expressing yourself through creativity. And it was very easy not to be creative, but it was very easy. There was no excuse not to be creative because these tools were always made available to us by our parents, my brother and I, and my sister and I, or I guess my sister, my brother and I, all of us. Um, So because those things were always around... I can remember this, the first moment where the guitar really jumped out at me and when I thought about playing it and writing songs with it and learning how to be you know, a lead guitar player and melody and stuff like that. And that was when I first tr- listened to this band, The Ventures, and this song called Walk, Don't Run, which is just an old surf song. And I was p- my mom still had the same 1964 Harmony uh guitar that she got when she was a child that she just had in the closet and I took it out and my dad wired up a little amp for me going through the stereo the home stereo and I just tried playing along and something just unlocked in me where I found this new tool I was eight years old and I found this tool that I could speak through in a similar way and it wasn't that I was very good at guitar at all for years but I felt that there was a way for me to express myself through it so it wasn't so much ever thinking like, wow, I can be an artist or I can be anything more than somebody who can also speak through making music. And I never thought about it as being an artist or being creative. It was just another thing that felt really comfortable for me and, and that felt good when I did it. And uh, I would always use that as the compass to chase new things and to learn new things. It wasn't about being more you know, being a, what can, what skill set can I learn to be a producer or what skill set can I learn to be a singer? They were always just things that I took on because I had an interest in learning and an interest in, in when I'd hit a wall creatively and I needed something else to, to learn so that I could expand that wall of creativity, um, or expression. That's, that was my compass for learning things. And even to this day, like, when I look at a lot of artist types and I look at a lot of people who consider themselves high art or artists or, or conduct interviews like they're special, I've never, I never take a look at myself in the mirror and think like that. I always just think like it's a way for me to speak and I, I, it makes me feel good to speak that way. And that's all it's ever been. That's, so it, it, there was the moment I learned the guitar, but I feel like even before that, it was always just something that made me feel good to to express myself in a different way than just saying things out loud. So, I mean, you obviously come from, you were just saying you come from a musical family, so they must have been quite receptive to the idea of, of you being a musician. 
Well, they were definitely receptive to me being a musician, but they were were understand understandably hesitant or apprehensive about me spending my life as a musician. Because they've seen the pitfalls themselves and stuff. Like that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. They lived, uh, you know, in in also sort of the height of when being a musician was. Well, I guess not really in the eighties. They were they were very involved in music in the seventies and eighties, but. They, you know, they they were around when you could be a rock star and you could be this. Everyone was larger than life, and every record deal was millions of dollars, and every record took months to make. You know, they worked at a record studio or a recording studio in um in California called the Record Plant. My dad worked on records with for Fleetwood Mac and Crosby, Stills and Nash, and all of these big bands. My mom sang on these records too. So you would think like, oh yeah, they're just going to say follow in the family footsteps and be creative and do that. But I think for them, when they saw how hard it was and not only how hard it was, but how hard it is to just be yourself and to not lose yourself in something or lose yourself in a drug or, or not know how to handle the workload of really doing it. Um, that's what they were more concerned in. Um, they were never concerned about like, well, can you make money and, things like that. It was more like, can you stay happy and can you enjoy yourself? And, and can you actually keep up with what will be asked of you? But they, they were always incredibly supportive. It was more just like, uh, Hey, I'm not going to go to college. I'm just going to figure this out. And then being like, you really should go to college just in case it doesn't. Um, but yeah, they, it was, uh, the easiest possible creative upbringing I could possibly imagine the most encouraging upbringing I could imagine I can't imagine a single moment growing up or being an adult where either of them could have done anything more positive for me and what I wanted to do yeah do they ever worry about the massive scope of the project the Deer Hunter project because I mean you've you, it's, do I or do, do, have they ever worried about it because it's cool. a lot of the stuff like the sheer scope of what you do is enough to crush like <laughs> People, you know, <laughs> they they more worry about when I show them something and it's really different, especially on this, this newest record. It's happened where are your fans going to like that or the, are they going to accept that or are they, you know, do you feel like you're going too far in this direction or that direction? But they do that more as like the the producers that they are like in in reflecting on it more so than as like it's funny because they're producers, but they're almost like it's like part producer, part parent in a weird way. And not like the parents of Brian Wilson or, or the father of Brian Wilson or anything like that. But it's, it's like this infinite empathy for being in a position where even a hundred people are waiting to hear a record and you know, they're going to scrutinize every angle of it. Um, they, they definitely share the concern, but they also 100% say like, do the thing that you believe you should do don't worry about what they're going to think until it's too late. And that's usually how I've done it is I just do it and I do it and I do it. And then the moment where I think like, Oh, I wonder what people will think is when an album's finished, mastered and ready to go out. And, and I think that's the way you have to do it. Otherwise you, it's not really self-expression anymore. It's, it's uh, product development, you know, I've got to say, it's kind of heartening to see to sort of hear that you have that fear of, I wonder what people will think because people that are, a lot of people I've spoken to, you never really get a sense that they have that worry. Oh, they're lying. Mm -hmm. They're lying. Yeah. You you can't... It's impossible to not be aware of of the fact that somebody... And like I said, even if it's 100 people or 10 people, when you work at a company and you have to turn in a project, you know somebody is... I'm going to turn the light on really quick. No worries. You know that somebody is going to get it. They're going to see what you've done. And they're going to scrutinize it. As a creative person, it should only be self-expression. But that's the scariest thing is that if you're doing it only out of self-expression, that at some point it goes through a filter and it becomes a product regardless. of what. It doesn't matter how pure the, the artwork is. At some point it gets put into a product, into a sleeve. It's for sale and it's up to whoever buys it to think whatever they want about it. So it's not that I will ever let that dictate 
the choices that I make, but it's impossible. It would be impossible for anybody to truly mean that I make this thing for my heart. It gets sold. And then who cares what anybody thinks about it? Um, Cause otherwise there's absolutely no reason unless what you're really hoping for is someone to enjoy something. Then you have to be afraid that they might not. You have to think, I want you to love this. I want this to mean something to you. I want you to take away from this part of what I put into it. And I hope that the opposite doesn't happen. And, and that hope that the opposite doesn't happen is just summed up in a mild concern that, that someone's going to hear it and someone's going to miss, miss the thing that you put into it and, and miss the subtlety and, and inter- interject their own judgment and their own connotation for what you meant by things and why you did things a certain way. And that's why you get so many people who like, you know, scathing pitchfork style reviews is because it's uh it's its own level of entertainment too. The the negative is its own level of entertainment. But but for me, I mean I care or else I would just do it and never put it out. I want people who hear it, people who have been here supporting me and giving me the opportunity to do this 10 years in, I want them to get what they feel like they want to get out of it. And if they don't, and if they feel like I missed the boat, or if they feel like I missed the mark, it's a concern. I I don't want that to happen. But again, it doesn't have any play in what I'm doing when I'm doing it. it. It's only in the moment like now, where it's a few days out, and I'm thinking, okay, is this the record where people are going to sign off and people are going to say, well, you know, whatever. I'm not into it anymore. I didn't like that record. I'm over it. But yeah, anyone who says that they never think about the is either lying or is an emotional vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> but you're quite lucky though, because Deer Hunter fans are, from my experience, are very receptive to what you're, what you're, what art you're presenting to them. Yes. They well, a lot of, a lot of artists just don't have that. No, but I think that that also comes with artists who have carved out their audience through uh, sort of the genre adherence. And when you then when you sort of explore your wiggle room within your own sound, you lose people along the way. Whereas, I mean, it's been 10 years of really working hard to find a deer hunter audience and, and people who like the deer hunter and not people who... You know, there's a lot of bands who have piggybacked on other bands' sounds or on other tours or swooped in at just the right time when this band exits and there's an opening in that style of music or hit on the radio and then kind of done another single that's similar enough to keep people interested and then they try something left of center and they lose people along the way. But for us, it's just been do the thing that I like to do and slowly pick up people along the way. Five people per show on this tour, 10 people per show on that tour. But what happens is a deer hunter audience is, is generated. It's not, it's not just, I mean, there's surely there's casual listeners, but for the most part, it's people who get involved and people who, who have an attachment to the music because it's not made to be flashed in a pan. It's made to be slowly simmered and digested and then, reflected upon and I'm sure there's plenty of people who just throw it on and don't give a shit but I've noticed that most of our fans are incredibly thoughtful listeners and actually take time to dive in I mean it's not it it is music that kind of takes attention a little when everything's so instant it's good to know that there's artists out there are still doing that you know like they're making music which is for people to sit and think deeply about I think there are a lot I think there are a lot of them. I think it's just they don't like the deer hunter. You know that you don't hear a ton about them because they're not making hits. But that's good. I mean, it has its place. It does have its place. It has it's it's a different world. It's it's almost not music, and I know it is, but it's almost it's like there's music, there's film scores, there's you know commercial jingles, there's pop. And it's its whole other thing because it's it's music decided by a committee from start to finish. And it's not about does this song perfectly represent the heart and soul of the artist who's singing it. It's about 
does this song fit the artist's catalog enough to attract their audience to sell a shitload of records and hopefully either get put in a movie or something like that so that everybody can cash in. And it's understandable, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just a different thing than music as music. It's just absolutely, unapologetically, music as a product, and that's completely okay. But it's so different. So to try and do this thing and to have animosity that you don't fit into the product world, it's like you are completely forgetting about the beautiful opportunity you have and to just be yourself and to just be creative and to just put out music for the sake of people listening to it because that's the audience you're making it for are people who want to sit down and they want more than just a soundtrack to their daily lives of of you know menacing similarity they need something that provides them just a little bit more so that's that's okay that it's not a hit and then no you know i'm not going to cash in it's fine so many questions now <laughs> um one that i want to ask you just kind of going back to a little bit to like i guess having a creative family mm-hmm. you've spoken in many interviews about how you treat writing and being creative as work which i think is the best way to be a creative person all the people i know they treat it like work because you need to right. go in day in day out and get results yeah. you just have to do it yeah but where did that discipline come from i think it came from my parents i think that seeing the way that my father 
approaches his work with an obscene ethic with, uh, you know, when he gets into it, when it's time for him to do the thing that he is setting out to do, he, against any possible hurdle or wall that he finds, he commits himself to crashing through it. And sometimes it's at the risk of, you know, loss of sleep, um, sort of loss of mental awareness. Uh, but it's just because there is an in- inexplicable euphoria when you reach your little milestones, ho- however far you set them, there's a, a absolute euphoria that you feel when you, when you hit that place that you only imagined. And whether that's, you know, the goal line that you've set from at the end of the road when you start writing a song and then you get to the point where it's, it's recorded and mixed and mastered and you hear it and you say to yourself like, yes, that is what I was, that's what I was praying it would get to. And against, you know, against the, the unremovable filter between your heart and your, your hands, you were able to do the thing that you set out to do. Um, and because that, end game is so rewarding personally and selfishly. Um, the work never feels like work. I treat it like work in the sense of like, I'm here to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to let the things on the outside deter me or sway me. I've, I, I love this thing that I get to do and I'm not going to take it for granted. So I treat it like work in that way, but the payoff is something that I, I is it's inexplicable. And that's that, Reattaining that feeling and that that uh, euphoria is why any amount of hours, any amount of arguments, any amount of work is uh, there's no argument against it in my mind. There's never anything that comes up where it's like, ah, you know, fuck it, throw it in the towel. I'm over it. I it's just so easy to sit down and commit myself to something that I have an unapologetic passion for, and that goes through more than just you know making music, but music is top, absolute top for me. I mean, the, the Deer Hunter is now a multimedia project, more or less. Like, it has become beyond more than hopefully just the music. Yeah, hopefully even more. I would love for that to happen. You've done you've done quite a lot of late as well. Um, I mean, Act, Act 1 has become a graphic novel, mm-hmm. um, which I was going to ask about later on, but I've just brought it up, so I'll ask you now. Yeah, it's, it's done. Oh. It's artwork's done, lettered everything all the pages are ready to print but we are like exploring some very last minute opportunities to maybe partner with a bigger partner who can you know who has actual distribution because the main thing about the the book uh, and these books is I'm working with a writer and an artist who have a vested interest in being a you know graphic novel and comic book writer and artist I want them to not only represent the deer hunter story and the story of act one to a T, but I want it to be a good graphic novel. I don't want it to just be supplemental material. That's like a really cool set of liner notes. I want it to be something that if you didn't give a shit about the band and you dove into this book, that it's interesting and that you want to know what happens next and that you, you are excited about these characters and the artwork and the dialogue isn't just lyrics, you know? So the writer I'm working with, his name's Alex Dandino, and he so far has written Acts 1 through 3, scripts for all of them. And uh, so all of the artwork's done for one. We're trying to partner up with somebody who can maybe distribute it beyond just selling it online. But if that, you know, if that doesn't work out, we're ready to just print it in the next month or two, I think. Was it, was it hard to, to give over your creation to another writer? To, 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 there's a lot of narrative depth you know, and, and the deer hunter stuff. It, it seems to me... He was so respectful. And so... Th- it was not hard because he was passionate about it. And because he jumped in and fleshed things out. But he fleshed them out with constant fact-checking with me. Like, do you think this would happen in, in the world? Or would would this character say this? Is this something that they would do? These little details. And he would always ask me, and what was really fun was 
arguing about it and him saying, this is what they would do. This is how they would say that. And me saying, no, 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 this is the way it would go. And then he'd say, no, listen, and he'd walk me through my own characters and my own story. And then I'd be like, yeah, actually, you're right. You're, you kind of get this better than I do. So because of his passion and his detail, it was, it was effortless to hand it over. He's also a good friend. And he also, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about Acts 1 through 6 entirely. Because um, he needed to know everything. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, and uh, so in my head at first, it was like, well, do I, you know, yield that power? But that was maybe 10 seconds <laughs> of thinking that. And then like, yeah, of course, somebody who writes graphic novels should write this. Because otherwise, it, I think it would be like a weird chopped up version of my lyrics. I don't consider myself an author. I, I write songs. This happens to be a concept project, but this is an author. Mm-hmm. So it was easy. It was very easy. And and I loved what he did. So, yeah. Because I was going to ask you, like, although the Deer Hunter is mostly, apart from a narrative um, about through the one, Acts 1 to 6, it's an artist's artist writers writers like myself and writers that I've spoken to on this podcast. They always, even if the the protagonist isn't exactly who they are, there's always autobiographical details somewhere oh, yeah. in there. So that was why I was kind of curious as to how easy it would have been for you to go well, because that's still quite a personal connection to to you, you know, to the deer hunter, you know. Well, I think the fun thing about that side of it, about the the somewhat autobiographical inclinations of the character and uh where it mirrors my life and where it doesn't i think that that also provided a lot of really interesting conversations with the writer and with alex um or with alex who is the writer um because the way the story was fashioned and the narrative was fashioned in how i fleshed it out it's very one-sided and it's from my perspective and all of the characters from my life who i've represented fictionally it's still very one-sided so it's really fun because it's it's like watching an historian's view a third party perspective on fictional history and that's kind of what he took and he was able to have a much better bird's eye view or god's eye view of this story and the way that things the the mechanism of these relationships and the way that the world worked that I'm not even necessarily that capable of having of the story because it is written from my perspective and these characters are coming from my perspective and you know, the romantic, I don't know how to say it. I don't think that's the right word, but the romanticizing of my life through this fiction is very one-sided who I demonize and, and who gets the triumph and all that. It's all based on my own, either bitterness or hopefulness. So having him come in and, and it was, it, I wouldn't say therapeutic, but it was, it was wonderful to see somebody's perspective on my perspective and how they flesh out and how, like in those scenarios where he's saying like, well, this is what that character would do. It gives me this weird new perspective on scenarios that have been romanticized from my own life. And then I'm thinking about the things they came from and having a secondary perspective on those things. And um, it would be unattainable, I feel like, given the way that I wrote the story to begin with. So it was defi- it's definitely interesting to see somebody pick it up, this story that you know has a lot of ties to my life, but then make it their own, where it still has ties to my life, but it's not really autobiographical. It's a strange web. But um, no, honestly, just... He's such a good writer and he's so thoughtful and he's so interested in only making the best story he can that every part of it has been absolutely wonderful. Was so I know I know like you you use the the first person in a lot of the Deer Hunter songs, Mm -hmm. but it's set in a a narrative and I guess it's fiction to a certain degree. Do you think that's a way of like maybe using it to objectively explore things that have kind of Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's also ways for me to I mean because a lot because a lot of the songs are are in first person from not, you know, from other characters than the main character. And I think that you know, even 
is in like uh, in Act Two. There's the song "Evicted," which is sung from Miss Leading's perspective. Miss Leading was somebody who is, you know, a romanticized version of somebody in my life who I really had great disdain for. But when I was writing that song and when I, you know, the application of that song in the story, it brought my sort of bitterness down pretty far because it put me in that perspective and it had me think a little bit about things more than I would just being a bitter 22-year-old or 23-year-old. You know, just something that simple is writing a song from the perspective of some fictional character who has some loose representation to somebody in my life. It just... It it gave me that perspective and that you know objective exploration of of my life. As r- ridiculous as that does sound, it just it it's a really interesting thing. Writing the music for I mean, interesting for myself writing the music the way that I have and the story the way that I have. It's very strange in hindsight when I go back and revisit things. It's very strange. I don't think it's strange or ridiculous because writers do it all the time. They use it to analyse parts of their life they maybe didn't understand. And you get more sympathy if you're plugging somebody that you maybe have weird feelings for into this avatar, this vessel, and you have to kind of choose to understand their psychological reason for doing whatever they did to you. I think that's perfectly valid, especially if you're a creative person and you create art, which is speaking both to you and as you would hope, and as is proven the case, as will probably prove the case tonight as well, to many other people yeah. as well. You know, yeah, I think that's, that's very liberating. As oh, it absolutely is. It is very liberating. It allow, it definitely allows you to let go of a lot of things that you you come to realise you've wrongfully gripped for for too long. Absolutely. And so now we're sitting here in Scotland talking about it, which is probably quite bizarre. Yeah, it is very bizarre, <laughs> but it's wonderful. And um, so... Can I just ask then, was there any kind of reason you decided to kind of be more introspective, even more so on Migrant, than you were in the Axe? I guess the best way to describe it would be kind of cleaning out the bottom of the barrel in that writing the stories and writing the fiction of it, it was always kind of like emptying out a container but never really cleaning it out so there was always these things left over and feelings that would sp- still be stuck in there because they didn't necessarily fit in in the story and jamming them in there would have just been like well I'll just throw this thing I'm going through because I'm going through it even though it has no place in here so when it came time to write Migrant I mean a lot of a lot of the color spectrum ended up being you know, similar to Migrant in the way that it was things I had never really thought of or or sung about or, or written about. And the concept of the color spectrum allowed me or pushed me in certain directions. But Migrant was very much like a, if I'm going to continue writing anything conceptual or if I'm going to dive back into that, I think it's time to just take stock of myself and, and remove any sort of veil or for myself get rid of the fictional sort of facade of or or representation and just write things from an unrestricted place and I think that that's exactly why afterwards it felt like it was okay to go back and to do act four was because I wasn't I didn't feel like I was still hanging on to so many things that I had been hanging on to for so long and it was just you know, I think that's really it. It's just I didn't want to jam jam pack them into the story for the sake of therapy, but also they were lingering for a long time. And then writing Migrant, it was just like, okay, what what would I like? What would I like this to be about, or what should this be about? And that was the only thing that dictated what the record was about. But it was funny because it immediately afterwards it was like, okay, I want to go, I want to go into Act Four. Yeah. I didn't say anything about it for a long time because I wasn't sure I would, but. It, it was exactly what was supposed to happen. So that's a very that's a fascinating concern to have, like that clearing out, and it's just like being so. Um, <coughs> I'm trying to think of the word, like so attached to the narrative that you'd created, like for acts, and then you're obviously honouring it by going, well, no, that's not like these are not supposed to be in here. It was you know? tough. I mean, when I finished Act Three, was when I first felt it 
where I felt like I had run myself dry, but it wasn't the right kind of dry. It wasn't like a, like a bloodletting. It was like a, like I didn't know how I could write more of that story because I felt like I had used my experiences up completely. And the only ones that I felt like I could still pull on in a new or refreshing way for myself had nothing really to do with that story. Um, and so it was like, I got to go experience more life, but in the meantime, I'm going to make some music and it's going to be about these things. And then once I've gone through a little bit more, I can pull on those once it's time for act four. And that was always kind of how I designed the story. And, and the six acts was, I I didn't want to necessarily be tethered to my life as a 23 year old for the next decade and write only about those experiences. I wanted to, as I learned and, and, you know, paralleling my life within this story and this character growing up and, and growing older, it needed me to grow up and grow older. I, I, I do not have the enlightened sensibility to write the life of a 40 year old at 20. It, it takes me learning more and trying and failing things and, you know, relationships and, and heartache and again, triumphs and, pitfalls and everything that just everyone goes through the natural course of life. I, I, I needed that to continue happening for me to continue fictionalizing it. <laughs> I think that's it. It seemed given the very nature, uh, the scope of, of Dear Hunter's music, it seemed very logical to me that, um, you would do something more symphonic, oh, yeah. which, which you did. Um, I actually still haven't heard it yet. I've got to be honest. I've not. I've not heard. I'm not. I'm, most people in the world haven't heard it. I'm not going to pronounce it because my Scottish accent will mangle the words. Amour and attrition. Yes. <laughs> Say it. It would sound better than I. Than amour I, and attrition. That's way. Amour better. and attrition. I don't know. <laughs> um. Say no. Amour and or amour and attrition. That's fine. I didn't make the words up. I mean, they've been said by plenty of Scottish people <laughs> in I different hope contexts. So, yes. Well, no, probably not in relationship to the record itself, but the words. So what was it like doing that? Like, was that was that scary? Was that yeah. hard? Yeah, it was the kind of thing where I had been getting more and more into the technicality of preparing sheet music and and writing music to be p- performed by you know traditionally trained musicians, whether it was in Deer Hunter Records or live performances and things like that. <sighs> And something just in me was like, well, let's, it's time to take a big leap. You've been doing this for a string quartet here and there. And how about something way more exciting? How about a huge challenge? And I told my manager that I wanted to try writing a symphony. And I think neither of us really knew what that was. But I just was like, yeah, that word is something I want to do. And um, the sort of guiding framework we had in our minds was, okay, let's crowdfund this because a your record label won't pay for it b you can't pay for it let's crowdfund it and if the crowd funds it it's something they would be interested in hearing if they don't then you have no place doing it and there's no audience for you so that was the test it was like if you raise the money to do this then people will be interested enough for you to try it if you don't then throw in the towel and just realize it's not for you and it was raised crazy quick and that was the scary thing. It was like, oh shit! Like, I ha- I have to do it now. I there's there's no backing out. So then it was just intense work and intense study. And I don't really learn well from anything other than just diving headfirst into something. So, you know, I got a few books. I started writing on the piano, and then I went to Brno in the Czech Republic and uh, got to work with a really fantastic symphony orchestra and a really amazing conductor named Mikhail Toms. Um, and that was, it was a dream come true, absolutely. Yeah. How much of that is informed Act 4? Uh, all of it. Yeah. I, I uh, a few months after it was released, I got a, a Twitter message from, his name's Dave, Dave Meschler, or David Meschler, and he is the, conductor of an orchestra called awesome orchestra in berkeley california and he asked me if there was any way to 
get a hold of any of the sheet music from a more anatrician. And as we got to talking, he said, you know, both I and um, my, uh, the, uh, the orchestra's, you know, um, arranger are big deer hunter fans. And then we got to talking and it was like, okay, I think get you the sheet music. We were talking on the phone. Um, they wanted to perform one of the movements. And I said, Hey, would you just out of nowhere, would you want to record on the next deer hunter record? And, uh, and he was like, uh, that sounds amazing. Um, what, what's it going to be? And this was a, a while back. And I said, nobody knows this yet, but it's going to be act four. And I want it to be everything I've wanted any act record to be so far, but this has to be exactly what it's supposed to be or else it shouldn't be anything. And that's as we got more into talking about the story and the scope of everything. And they had been listening for a long time. And then we just decided to do it. Band went off. We did the record. I prepared the sheet music. I gave it to the arranger um, who he didn't arrange all of the music, but he prepared. He did the part preparation and sort of proofreading and also did some additional orchestration. And he actually did. His name is Brian Adam McCune. He did string quartet arrangement for the song waves and the song there's a song called is there anybody here and uh, he arranged the string quartet for that um but i went there and again it was like just a dream i did not th- we had a 50 piece orchestra on the record and we recorded it in uh this beautiful studio in berkeley california called uh fantasy studios that was you go in and you feel like you're you are in one of those stereotypical studios you see in a movie, like the big, beautiful wooden room, huge ceilings, isolation booths, big board, an amazing engineer who I feel like I can't remember his last name. His first name is Jesse. I want to say his last name is Nichols, but he was a phenomenal engineer and the mic placement. And I'm sure no microphone in there was less than $5,000 or something. So it was just this situation where every step of the way it, it was like, why, why, why am I even allowed to do this? Like, who is making this possible for me? And actually, that is a good opportunity to say, the guy who made that possible, because it was not in our budget, um, his name's Kevin Pereira. And he, I don't know if you ever heard of a show called Attack, Attack of the Show, which was a, have you heard of that? Do you remember Kevin Pereira? He was one of the hosts, and he was the, one of the producers. But he does a lot of online stuff. He's a, he's a show producer. He's a host. He's, you know, very involved with, like, uh, social media and stuff like that. He, he is a big Deer Hunter fan and, a su- and supporter. And when I told him that I had this opportunity, he said, and I said, you know, and I don't have the money to do it. And he's like, well, what if I basically, you know, fund this to happen? And, and what if maybe, and this is one of the things we want to do, we prepare a version of the recording that's only the orchestra rearranged and released as its own piece entirely just the orchestra of the record and so that's one of the things that we're working on and that's kind of like the idea that we have of he's funding this we are given the opportunity to release it as its own thing entirely and uh, that is how you know our situation will work out and benefit him so that it's not just like the lotto for me and like yeah hey thanks for funding my dreams i'll talk to you later um, but he is just just the most amazing, encouraging person. I've been, it, it's like a constant dream I'm afraid I'll wake up from because I'm given way too many opportunities that I don't feel like 99.99 with a bar over it percent of the world's population that will ever live will have the opportunities that I've been given just on random choice of, of the population of Earth. And it just keeps on happening with with amazing people that I meet and musicians and orchestras and individuals who just believe in, in what I'm doing and want to support it. It's, it's obscene. It's obscene. So I guess one of the last questions I should ask you um, is stylistically then from, from act three to act four, there's been a big, a big, a big time difference and you've done a lot of things 
So I guess that there, there must be quite a large way. You must have approached it in a much different way, but also there must be quite a large stylistic difference between that and the last act's record. Yeah, but then I feel like there's a pretty, a pretty large leap stylistically for most of them. From act one to act two, even though they feel, when you listen to them back to back, they're relatively seamless. There's not a song like 1878 anywhere on act two. And there's not a song like Smiling Swine really anywhere on Act 3. But at the same time, you know, they do have similar DNA in the same way that Act 4 shares that same DNA. But it is its own record, just like Act 3 is its own record. I mean, Act 3 is a much more theatrical record than Act 2. And Act 2 is a much more aggressive record than Act 1. And Act 1 is a much more ambient record than Act 3, but Act 4 feels like a culmination of them all. And there are undoubtedly things that are similar between Act 4 and, you know, Acts 1, 2, 3, Migrant, and The Color Spectrum. There's, there's things that just have shaped me as a songwriter from writing those records as well. But that being said, there's so much more in common with Acts 1 through 3 in Act 4 than in Migrant or The Color Spectrum. It's an absolute return to that that method of making an album. Um, but it absolutely has been shaped by the, that six-year gap in writing. Um, and I didn't want to just do fan service either. I didn't want to say, like, okay... What are all the things I'm supposed to do on an axe record? Okay, here we go. Let's do this. Throw that in there. All right, do that song. We'll do that song. It was. It, it, it's a different story. It's a different time period in the story. It's it's a different uh, set, setting. Um, characters have different outlooks. Characters have different identities. Um, it's it should be different, but it it absolutely feels like an act record. Casey, that's been awesome. Is there anything else you want to say or anything you want to ask me before we finish? I am just grateful that you took the time to talk to me. That's all. It's been an absolute pleasure, sir. An absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, man. Very much. Well, we went down the rabbit hole there, Casey and I, having a chat in the back of their tour van. It was it was great. It was he's such a nice guy, man. He's so humble and he's so passionate and yeah. If you ever get a chance to talk to him, please do. He's just he's just a staggering human being a staggering human being he's a tower of creativity he's a tower of a man but he's a tower of creativity it's, it's awesome so that's all for this episode thank you for listening like I said if, if you've got any ideas of anybody you would like me to speak to please drop me an email I would appreciate that and also if you take some time to go on to iTunes to give me a rating and review that would be superb I would appreciate that no end I would really, really appreciate that. I'd appreciate that so much. In fact, I'd, I'd appreciate it so much that if you go do it and if we ever meet in person, which I hope we do meet in person, I want to meet people that like this podcast because I don't get a lot of communication for you guys. I know there's lots of people listening, but there's not a lot of people talking to me, so let, let's sort that. Talk to me. Let me buy you a beer. I don't know, something like that. Anyway, thank you for listening going to play you out now with the final track on Act 4, Rebirth and Reprise and this song is called Ouroboros and I hope you enjoy it until next time bye bye
Thanks for listening to this podcast, which is brought to you by Acast. Like you, millions of people enjoy podcasts every week. Acast works with thousands of amazing shows, reaching the most engaged, loyal and desirable audiences on demand. For more information about advertising, sponsorship and branded content opportunities for your business, contact us using sponsor at acast.com.